Hello, everybody. This is Jake Senzio, host of the Jake and Gino podcast here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbo. Gino, how's it going? Jake, this is going to be an amazing podcast. You know why? Tell me more. I've been working my entire life for this moment because I felt the resistance when I read the book, The War of Art. It, it, to me, it was life-changing, and, and I already gone through the epiphanies. I want to hold both of these books up for everybody right here, The War of Art and Turning Pro. And uh, you know, I've got six kids. I've got an amazing wife. I rarely make promises in life because I know they always backfire. But if you're listening to the show right now and you're procrastinating, you don't know the next step, you're feeling resistance, you're stuck. I promise you, if you go out and you buy The War of Art and you read it, it will help you. It will give you clarity. I call it a casamiento, though. It's like in Spanish, it's a wedding. It's the rice and the beans. You can have the rice, it's great. You can have the beans, it's great. But if you put them together marriage made in heaven. It's just like Jake and Gino. Jake by himself is really good. Gino by himself is really good, but you put them both together. So I promise everybody out there, go and pick up the War of Art. It's got over 11,000 five-star reviews on Amazon. So there's a lot of people out there that agree with me. I love the book. It was amazing. I picked this one up. And then after I read this turning pro, I felt that resistance within me. Should I, should I reach out to Stephen Pressfield? Is he going to think I'm a loser? Is he going to say yes? Is he going to say no to me? And fortunately, I had you know Jake on my shoulder. Lifting and you're the G daddy. You got this. And, and I said, you know what? I'm going to try. If he says no, not the end of the world. It's okay. But I knew that resistance was telling me that I needed to do that. So we're going to be diving into all these topics today. Uh, I'm super excited to be on, on the call here. And thank God I overcame my resistance and we're able to bring Stephen Pressfield to you today. All right, I'm still giving the formal intro because that's just what we do, and then we're going to hit this. So our guest today wrote for 27 years, working 21 different jobs before getting his first novel published. He is a definition of hard work. I was first introduced to him by a Ray Dalio recommendation for the book, The War of Art. So without further ado, Stephen Pressfield, welcome to the show. Jake, thanks for having me, Gino. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It, it is our pleasure. And so Gino always picks on me for jumping right into things, but I'm guessing that Minimum 85% of our folks have already read the book, The War of Art. So I was fascinated with how you're able to identify resistance as such a mortal enemy to living a more creative and productive life. Was it dumb luck or was it trial and error that allowed you to identify how resistance was holding you back? Or was it something else? Because I think that that's one of the keys to it is that you isolated this problem that many of us just deal with, but never realize it's there. Jake, I'm coming from it, not from being an entrepreneur or a businessman, but being a writer. Right. Anybody that has ever sat down across from one of these things knows that as soon as you face that blank computer screen, you feel this tremendous negative force radiating off at you to try to stop you from doing your work, mm -hmm. you know, and it will do things like, uh, say, well, uh, let's not work today. Let's go to the beach today. Things are, you got a lot of stuff on your mind. Let's take a little break. Or it'll say things like, you are a loser. There's no hope for you. Who do you think you are sitting down to try to write something? Mm -hmm. You know, it's been done, whatever your idea is, it's been done a million times better by other people, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, so after like about seven years of being totally having my ass kicked by this force that I could never give a name to this negative force, I just suddenly started to think of it as resistance with a capital R because it radiates off that screen like, like resistance. And I know in the entrepreneurial world that if you have to do something like cold calling or taking any of those steps that uh, will um, bring up fear, self-doubt, you know, you'll put it off. You'll come up with excuses, da, da, da. I mean, resistance, I always say, if you've ever bought a, uh, what do you call it? a treadmill mm -hmm. and home and it's rest, gathering dust in the attic, you know what resistance is. Resistance is this negative force that's out there. And we never, we don't think it's there. We sort of think, oh, gee, I want to get into the real estate business, the high-end real estate business. I'll just do it. No problem. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you find that there's something that's stopping you. Fear, self-doubt, procrastination, perfectionism, arrogance, et cetera, et cetera. And for me as a writer to identify that force and give it a name so that when it hits me, I can say, oh, that's not me saying that. That's resistance. That was the huge breakthrough for me. And um, I say at the very start of the War of Art that there's a secret that real writers know that wannabe writers don't know. 
And the secret is this. It's not the writing part that's hard. It's sitting down to write. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to entrepreneurs across the board. It's not the actual work that's hard. It's sitting down to do the work. Mm -hmm. You've written in the book, the resistance can't be seen, heard, touched, or smelled, but it can be felt. We experience it as an energy field radiating from a work in potential. It's a repelling force. It's negative. Its aim is to shove us away, distract us, prevent us from doing our work. I want everyone to really let that sink in. And if that's going on in your life, and it doesn't have to happen in every aspect of your life, you could be crushing it in one aspect of your life, figure out what really works there. And then another aspect may not be working. Let, let's reassess that. But there's one quote that I'd like to share with, with both of you that really helped me with resistance. Jake over there has always helped me with resistance in the last 10 years. If I don't do want to do it for myself, I need to do it for my partner. But the quote is, our perception of who we are changes what we do. At one time in my life, when I perceived myself as being a multifamily investor, the resistance is holding me back. But if I want to see myself as a multifamily investor, or if I want to see myself as a healthy person, what are the actions that I need to take? I came home Sunday night from Knoxville, exhausted, tired. I want to see myself as a healthy person. What do I do? I'm a runner. So Sunday night at eight o'clock, I went and I ran three miles. If I didn't perceive myself as that person, I wouldn't take that action. And the same thing when I started my multifamily journey, I didn't perceive myself as a multifamily investor. Once I started changing that, I was able to, you know, fight off that resistance. You know, what do you think about that, Stephen? Well, in a way, you know, you, you held up the second book, you know, Turning Pro. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what you just said, I would call that Turning Pro. Mm -hmm. It's sort of an attitude shift where most of us, when we start out and we fail, are operating like amateurs in our mm -hmm. mind. And we think like amateurs and we have amateur habits. Mm -hmm. And once we change, flip that switch in our mind and start thinking like professionals and start developing professional habits, that's just what you said of how you think of yourself is what you'll do, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you think about Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or somebody like that, if they're got a little touch of the flu, you know, I know Kobe died, so he doesn't mm -hmm. have the flu, but mm -hmm. if in their heyday, if they're a little MJ's down, flu game, classic, angry. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. MJ had the classic flu game in the playoffs where he had yeah. the flu and he went out and he kicked ass. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if, if, if he had had an amateur attitude, he would have said, oh, I'm sick. I better go lie down. Right. But he said, I'm a pro. I don't care what's wrong with it. If my leg isn't broken and if my skull isn't fractured, I'm playing. And that's kind of the same, you know, that's what Gino, when you ran those three miles, that's a kind of a smaller version of that, mm -hmm. right? You said, mm -hmm. I could cave in, I could have an amateur habit and just go rest and lie down. Mm -hmm. But instead, I'm a pro, I'm going to get up and I'm going to run the three miles. Mm -hmm. and of course, I'm sure when you got back, you felt a million times better. And you felt like, you know, everything's going, everything is positive. Mm -hmm. It's those little steps. And I'm quoting Stephen Pressfield here. I didn't pull the fucking pin basically in the book. That's what you talk about. It. <laughs> talk about that story. It's an amazing story. All these metaphors and all these pictures that you can make for yourself will only reinforce and give you those habits. Uh, can you share that story in the book about pulling the pin? I love that. <laughs> well, uh, at one point in my, in my twenties, I was uh, doing migrant labor and I was, um, uh, you know, living in a bunkhouse picking fruit. And um, the, the guys who were there were basically fruit tramps. You know, who went from harvesting, you know, apples to cherries to whatever it is. And the uh, they a lot of them rode the rails, the old type of, you know, Union Pacific thing. The way one railroad car uncouples from another is they pull the pin. Mm -hmm. So pulling the pin in fruit tramp lingo meant quitting. Mm -hmm. You know, and you would wake up in the morning on these places in the bunkhouse and there'd be a couple of guys missing, right? Their beds would be empty. You say, hey, what happened to Jack? And he's going to say, oh, he pulled the pen, mm -hmm. you know? And I, for like my first seven years of trying to write, I pulled the pen constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd get 99% of the way through a book and I'd just blow it up. I'd quit. I'd run away. So that's another aspect of sort of thinking of yourself as a professional. A professional never pulls the pin. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael Jordan doesn't pull the pin. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, 
Um, just sort of a little metaphor that I keep in my head all the time. So Stephen, Jake did say that he always jumps ahead and he always, you know, figures out he wants, he, he's, he, Jake's the snowplower. I'm the more the finesse kind of person. I want to get to know the guests a little bit better. Why writing for you? Why was writing a passion for you? You know, it's kind of a, kind of a mystery, you know, you know, you don't, I mean, it, what, for me, it wasn't like at, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was writing short stories or anything like that, uh -huh. but, uh, well, I'll give you a little bit of the longer version of this story here. I, my first job was as a junior copywriter at a big ad agency in New York. Mm -hmm. And I had a boss named Ed Hannibal and he wrote a novel and it became a hit and he quit to become a writer. Mm -hmm. And like overnight, he became like this famous guy. And I thought, well, shit, why don't I do that? You know? <laughs> so of course, everything completely fell apart for like the next seven, 10 years. But somehow that planted the idea in my head that the only way I was going to save myself was, was as a writer. Mm -hmm. And so from that point, uh, I just, you know, became obsessed with that. You've been a prolific writer. What, which, what is your favorite book that you've written? Um, it's probably Gates of Fire, a book about uh, the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae. Oh. Um, if you haven't read it, it's a pretty good book. I'm going to read it. Yes, that, that is awesome. What would you get that for the office? You know, the guys will love that. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I, I, Jake, I was going through. I'm like, wow, he's written a ton of Bagger books. Vance. I, I, I mean, can we? Yeah, yeah. What was the inspiration behind Bagger Vance? I, I mean, I, I love that one. So um, do you want the long version, Jake? Sure, we got we got a little time. <laughs> yeah, give, give us give us some juice here. Um, there's a, a book. I don't know if you've heard of it called the Bhagavad Gita. It's been called the Hindu Bible. It was written in Sanskrit, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a wonderful kind of short book that I always read and I was just in love with. And in this book, the great warrior Arjuna is on the eve of a, of a huge battle. He's in the battle lines are formed. The chariots are there, the bows and arrows, the spears, the swords. And he looks across at the other, uh, the, the faces of the other men on the army and he recognizes friends and kinsmen, and he turns to his charioteer and his chair, and he says, I'm quitting. I see no point in, in facing these guys. Nothing good is going to come out of this. And his charioteer happens to be Krishna. In other words, God mm -hmm. in human form. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Krishna kind of reads our, the great warrior Arjuna, the riot act. And he says, get it together. You're going to go out there. You're going to fight. And the rest of the book is a sort of a treatise on the spiritual life, on karma, duality, non-duality, previous lives, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just thought one day, I'm going to steal this whole concept and I'm going <laughs> to just bring it into the world of golf. Mm -hmm. And instead of a great warrior, it's going to be a great golf champion. And instead of his charioteer, it's going to be his caddy. And so that, that was it. So I basically just kind of stole an idea from a Hindu scripture wow. and turned it into this crazy story. about Which God. ended up being uh, Will Smith and Matt Damon <laughs> a few years later. Right? <laughs> that is really cool. Can you um, describe the year of you going pro? I mean, how did you decide in your mind to go pro? What actions did you take to, to go pro? Uh, it's, that, that's a great question, Gino. And it really, I found that um, the act of turning pro for me was not a one-time thing. Mm -hmm. It took place over a, over a long period of time where mm -hmm. I would sort of, ha I had a moment when I just said, I describe it in the War of Art. It's that thing with washing the dishes, that scene in the sublet apartment in New York. Mm -hmm. where I just finally said to myself, I'm a writer, God damn it. I don't care what happens. I'm going to do this. But then I would write for the next three years and everything would fail. And so somewhere along the lines, I had to sort of regroup and say, okay, I'm, I'm turning pro again. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've learned a little more. It's gotten a little harder. I'm, so in other words, for me, it's sort of a, a continual process of rededication where I kind of come to the point of, should I quit? I, this is so hard. It's so, you know, uh, there's so many things against you. Maybe I should pack it in. And instead I say, no, I'm just going to rededicate myself and, and take it to the next level and do it even harder. So it's a kind of a continuing process over time for me. Mm -hmm. I think this is the reason the book spoke to me so much, because what we struggle with for folks getting into the multifamily space is that they view it as a pie in the sky. And before the show, I was telling you, it took us two years to get our first deal. 
it's very hard for people to keep coming back up to the plate in an inflationary environment in a very hot real estate market and getting rejected. It's not, it's, um, you know, not so much like the, you were saying cold calls before, but brokers have a ton of people trying to buy the apartments that they're selling. So, you know, you're the person trying to break into it. Any other advice or tips for somebody getting into the multifamily game now at the, the you know, if you want to say the height of the market, the most competitive time, and it could take you two to four years to really start turning pro. It's, it's a very, it's, it's a mental game. And that's why I try to say this to people, the best thing that we ever did, Gino and myself, is we stuck in there and we didn't quit. That's turning pro and showing up. How do you, how do you speak or connect with that person and tell them you got to hang in there? It's, it's just not going to happen for you. You know, sometimes people, I'll answer that, you know, Jake as a writer rather yeah. than as a real estate. There's a lot of similarities, I think, though. I, I really do. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's the absolute same thing. Just like being an athlete, being a warrior, being a mother, yes. it's all the same thing. But like, it took me 28 years from the time I, I quit a job to try to write until I published Bagger Vance. I was like 54 years old. So uh, I was just insane to keep doing that. But if, if somebody asks me any advice about anything, it's like, let's say you have a rock and roll band or you want to be a rap star, you want to be an actor. You, it, this is the same thing in real estate, right? It's 10 times harder than you think it's going to be, right? Mm -hmm. It really is. And it takes 10 times longer than you think it's going to take. And so if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be an amateur, you're going to be washed away with the tide. You know, it's just, that's what happens, right? You become a casualty and you're gone. You're off the field. They, they put you on a stretcher, they take you off the field, right? But if you look at it as a pro, you have to look at it as a long game. Now, for me as a writer, I say to myself, this is my life. This, this, is, this is a lifetime thing. I'm not going to give it two years. I'm not going to give it eight years. This is my life. So no matter what happens, I'm going to get back on the field, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot, the good news of this is I don't think you have to be very smart, Agreed. <laughs> From my personal perspective, I'm not speaking about yourself. <laughs> you love me in there, bro. What you have to do is sort of keep showing up mm -hmm. and keep learning. You know, little by little, you learn. You make a lot of mistakes. And if you keep showing up, that's, that's really the answer. None of these um, enterprises are for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Let me share. Like rock stars or somebody, you know, like... Uh, Bob Dylan or Neil Young or whatever, and they make it when they're 18 years old. And we say, oh my God, I should do that too. But that's just, those are freaks, you know? Mm -hmm. The real let, world is, it's, it's a long haul. Let me share a few things in the book that I want everyone to write these things down because this is what a quality of a professional is that doesn't pull the pin. They show up every day, number one. Number two, they're long term. Number three, they're patient. Number four, they seek order. Number five, they act in the face of fear. Next one, there's no excuses, right? And, you know, they dedicate to mastering technique. They defer gratification. These are all qualities of a professional. And I love in the book, you also say the addict is the amateur. The artist is the professional. The difference is their habits. Can you go into how does a pro practice and what kind of habits you need to create to become a pro? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, it's like, uh, uh, I won't get into the addict thing because that'll take us down a rabbit hole. <laughs> But um, those things that I was disclosed, those attributes of a professional mm -hmm. are the kind of things that we as, as writers or as entrepreneurs need to reinforce in ourselves every day. You know, it's like if, if you're a, a quarterback or a wide receiver or something in, in practice, you do drills over and over and over, right? Drop back drills as a quarterback, a seven step drop, a five step drop this, that, the other, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a wide receiver, there are like 21 different ways you can catch the ball, right? Mm -hmm. And you run those drills over and over and over. And every day you get a little bit better and you get a little bit more confident. And it's the same thing, like I'm sure in the real estate business of, of uh, approaching clients or approaching places where, you, where you're going to be rejected and you just have to keep doing it and keep the doing brokers. It and better at yeah, it it's the brokers at. selling them. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly the, the it's spot on right there. Yeah. 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 And I think um, I actually did a, a little talk at a, uh, a few days, a couple of months ago, about the mindset of a warrior. And one of them, which I equate to the mindset of an entrepreneur or an artist. 
And one of the things that uh, the attributes of a warrior is that a warrior is willing to train. And if you think of, you know, if you, I'm sure you've heard that famous thing of in a crisis, you don't rise to the occasion, you sink to the level of your training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, warriors or Marines or whoever have all kinds of action drills, immediate action drills, turn towards the sound of the guns, that kind of thing that they practice over and over because when the shit hits the fan, yes. you can't think, right? You mm -hmm. only can go into automatic mode and you need to be trained for that. Mm -hmm. And so part of the thing for, for a writer or for an entrepreneur is, is to always be going forward. You know, when something, an emergency hits, you lose funding, you know, a deal falls apart, uh, that the COVID hits and the government tells you that uh, people don't have to pay rent anymore, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It's always some emergency yeah. coming out of left field that you never right. could have predicted, right? Mm -hmm. And the amateur will fold. Mm -hmm. They'll go, oh my God, I can't, you know. But a professional says, okay, this is a blow. I, I'll just, what, what do I do? How do I react? You know, I'll take a minute, talk to my partner, sit down, whatever. And, uh, and each time you do that, over the that's training, that's self reinforcement, self validation, and and little by little, you do like like you were saying, Gino, your concept of who you are changes. After you've been doing it, like you guys have been doing it for a few years, you say to yourself, you know, I am a pro, mm -hmm. I have succeeded, I have done this before, and I can do it again, and that's the professional attitude. But constantly, you do need to be reinforcing yourself. Mm -hmm. The other aspect of this is, and I hope I'm not blathering on. Too no, much. I love it. No, no, it's great. If you're an athlete, if you're playing for the New England Patriots, you know, you've got a coach. Sorry for that. Go, don't take that. And I'm a Bills fan. And last <laughs> night's a little too soon already. You know, we we're, we're, we're one, one catch away in the end zone there. But anyways, sorry. <laughs> Bill Pilichek is a great coach. You know, uh. you've got a coach that's going to, he's going to reinforce you. He's going to tell you you're doing this wrong or you're doing this right. Mm -hmm. But you and me as entrepreneurs and as artists, we don't have that coach. Mm -hmm. We've got to be that coach ourselves. So we have to have that moment where you kind of sit down with yourself and say, okay, I've received this blow, right? The government said, whatever, what am I going to do about it? And uh, that's the hard thing. That's where amateurs fall apart and professionals keep it together. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of quotes I'd like to share with both of you. I, I think in reading Nir Yao's book on Hooked, he had a couple of quotes that really, really changed the way I think of things. He said, the drive to relieve discomfort is the root cause of our behavior. Everything else is the proximate cause. So if you think about it, we, we feel uncomfortable, we feel resistance, we're going to change that behavior. So, you know, this whole book is, is discussing that and driving into that. And that's really, really important. And I think the other thing is, we had uh, Luke Wren speaking at our live event at MM4. And what he said on stage to me was really powerful. He said, your language becomes your experience. Be careful how you speak to yourself. I mean, you know, when you, when the, you're, if you're in the real estate industry, you better know what a cap rate is. You better know what a cash on cash return is. You better be doing, putting in the work to become a professional. That's what we're talking about. You are not winging it here. And that's the thing you need to put muscles on. If you want to become a writer, you better learn how to write. You better learn your craft. So it takes time and you better learn the language of that experience. Um, Steven, I want to ask you before we go to the short answer questions, right now, do you feel resistance in your life? Do you, does anything come up to you and you go, well, I mean, I'm not feeling comfortable. I, I can diagnose it right away and I need to do uh, what I need to do to get over this resistance. Uh, the, the one thing I've learned, you know, is that resistance never goes away uh -huh. and it never diminishes. Mm -hmm. It's just as hard for me today as it was, you know, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, resistance is like this diabolical voice in your head. And it's so smart and so subtle and so nuanced that it will come up with new ways to psych you out. Mm -hmm. And you have to be sort of ready for them constantly. But um, it, it, no, it never, it never goes away. The only thing that helps me is I say to myself, I have beaten it in the past. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's really sort of a phony. It's kind of a, it's like resistance isn't, isn't real. It's only real reality is what we endow it with because we're afraid of it, then it has its strength. But if we just sort of dismiss it and just do our work, just sit down and do it, you know, 
Mm -hmm. then it goes away. Like you running for those three miles, that was a great thing to do. That was a real sort of answer of taking action, mm -hmm. taking positive action, get empty the brain mm -hmm. and just take positive action. Mm -hmm. It so sounds it, like the dark side of the force is what is, we're talking about exactly here. exactly what it is. And, and when I went to go life coaching school at IPEC, they taught us the energy blocks and energy blocks is anything that was either external or internal that is blocking us. Most of our energy blocks are internal and they taught us the gales, which are, it's an acronym for gremlin, assumption, interpretation, and limiting belief. Now, limiting belief is the, is the, is the, is the lowest one, but these are all part of resistance, right? Every time you've gone through resistance and gremlin is the highest one. So gremlin is what is you're talking about right there. The resistance within your head, you know, those demons, I'm too fat. I'm too ugly. I'm too slow. I'm not smart enough. And that's the powerful thing about life coaching, about coaching. You get out there and you start realizing that we are all winging it in this world. Not everyone has it figured out. And if we can figure that out and we can actually highlight what our gremlins are, me back at the restaurant, I'm just a pizza guy. Why am I going to go into multifamily? Jake is a pharmaceutical rep. He's never even known anybody who was in the business world. What gives him the right to do that? If we can understand that those are our gremlins and we can flesh them out and we can say to ourselves every day, we don't have to live that life. We can choose by reading the war of art and turning pro that will couple and that will help you progress and help you conquer your resistance. And by the, by the way, you know, in terms of, we were just talking about training, right? Mm -hmm. Listening to a podcast like this, that's training. Mm -hmm. Reading a book that's on that subject, that's training too. Mm -hmm. Going to, you know, did you say MM4? I'm not sure what that is, but yes, going to workshops, going, you know, Steve, that, that was our big multifamily event. That was that was the uh, that was the Catalina wine mixer last year. No, you want to talk about resistance? Eight hundred people on stage in front of eight hundred people saying, "What am I doing here?" Where five years ago I was in I was in the kitchen washing dishes. So talk about resistance. <laughs> that was a lot of resistance up there, but. I didn't start with 800 people. We started with a small venue, 10 people, then 20, then 30, then 175, then 350, then 500. And now it's 875. And next year, 1,200 people. That's how it works. You start small and you build those muscles. And again, that's it's training. Mm -hmm. It's a constant self-reinforcement. Mm -hmm. what, what you were saying about language before, Gino, I think... Mm -hmm. I think maybe he meant in addition to knowing the technical terms mm -hmm. of real estate, mm -hmm. it's the way we talk to ourselves, yes. the language that we use in our heads. And mm -hmm. I'm always fighting against being negative mm -hmm. in my own, in my own head, but um, that self-talk has got to be relentlessly positive one mm -hmm. way or another, however you make yourself do it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Maybe I'm, I'm the oddball out here, but I think since reading the book, since overcoming, um, personal resistance, like we all have in, in my life. And I think I'm at the point now, and maybe I'm just telling myself this, that I, I see something and I recognize resistance and I actually get giddy around it at times, knowing that it's now an opportunity. Stephen, have you ever experienced that? Or am I just a fruitcake over here? No, you're absolutely right, Jake. I feel like, okay. it's like when we experience tremendous resistance, that's a good sign. Yeah. Because resistance, again, is this diabolical negative force. And when we have a dream, whatever it is, an entrepreneurial dream or a, a book we want to write or a movie we want to make, if, if that dream is a big dream and it's very, very important to us, we're going to feel enormous resistance. Mm -hmm. If it's a little dream and then we don't really care about it, we'll only feel a medium resistance. Mm -hmm. So when we feel a lot of resistance, like if you're speaking to 800 people or whatever it is, it's a good sign because you can tell you, you, you can get giddy because you sort of say, ah, this is the, you know, it's like Ryan Holiday. This is where I'm supposed to be now. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? mm -hmm. When you feel that, that force pushing you really hard against you, you know, that's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. So Excellent. it's a good kind of navigation device. All right, gang, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one -on -one mentorship, 
on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single-family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team. And I want to let you know this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to jakeandgino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right, we are back. Now, this is we want to touch on on the the artiste side here, if you will. Any tips for someone who is struggling to pull out their inner inspiration? And I know I know it's showing up every day. I know that's that's the habit. You got to get there every day, but you know, more so, you know, as as an artist, how do you how do you get in the zone or how do you how do you really find it? Because even for us, we need to separate ourselves and create blue oceans. And our goal is to be the number one highest customer service organization in the multifamily space. So people don't even consider living somewhere else. They have such a great experience with us. You know, similar to that. How do you pull it out though, besides just showing up? Let me ask you, Jake, what do you mean by blue oceans? That so the crazy. blue ocean, there's a book out there, Blue Ocean Strategy, and it totally revolutionized how we uh, look at our business. We do not want to compete with other groups. We want to have such a superior product that we're out here just working within our organization. We have such a high level of service. We have such high craftsmanship in our communities that there really is no competition because we've identified in the multifamily space that there's a lack of service. There's a lack of hospitality. We want to treat people more like a Ritz Carlton experience than, you know, someone where here's the keys, there's your apartment home. So right. that's, that's our blue ocean. The red ocean is bloody where the sharks are eating each other, fighting over price. We're offering a, a you know, a, a competitive price, uh, but we have such a different level of service that we're out there operating in our own world, doing our thing, and we're going to let these these other yahoos, you know, fight oh, it out. Great. So, are you guys? Yeah. Do, you, do you know who Seth Godin is? Mm -hmm. Yes. O D I N. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like a great guru to me. You know, he has a blog yeah. and he has all kinds of classes that he teaches, and this is that's really his philosophy. Yeah. You know, that be the one person, the the outlier, the business that. Uh, that uh, once somebody's experienced it, they can't go back to anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a great way to look at it. But back to sort of what you were saying about yeah. how do you draw out. I think if if any of us were to, if I were to pose a question to every to let's, let's say we had 20 people sitting in front of us and I were to ask them, what in your deepest heart, in your private, private heart, is the one dream that you've got that that that's the key? closest to your heart almost everybody would be able to get it right away and what they would they would know it and immediately this is the power of resistance one millisecond later would come a voice oh you can't do that that's not you you're not capable of doing that so the point is it's sort of like i ask myself what's the next book i just finished one what am i going to do next and i sort of ask myself what is that one dream? What is the, the book that if I could do it, I would be really proud of myself? Or another way to look at it is, what am I most afraid of? What pro if I've got four projects in mind, which is the one that scares the shit out of me? You know, and I love that's that. the one to do. And, because, and again, the theory of resistance, the mechanics of this is resistance, like I say, is this diabolical negative force. And it knows, looking into our heart, that the key, the, the one dream that's the most important to us, the one dream that if we pulled it off would actually would help evolve our soul. And so it immediately will go after that dream in a negative way. You'll Crazy. never be able to do it. You can't do it. But that be whatever. So I sort of look for that feeling in my head. What am I most afraid of? What do I feel the most resistance to? And then then it is a question of becoming a professional. 
and saying, okay, if that's the thing I want to do, I want to write a book about the Civil War with uh, whatever. What are the steps I have to take to get there? Now I put on my professional hat. I've got to start research. I've got to do this, 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 this. And then just, then the key thing, like Gino running those three miles is simply to take action and do it. Mm -hmm. Here's the interesting thing. It's the old cliche, get comfortable being uncomfortable, but I don't really think that's true. I think it's more so getting to the other side of it and accepting it because ultimately it's a mindset shift many times where you there's the resistance that you're talking about, but the minute that you accept that you're going to work through it and you put yourself in the mode, everything seems to be okay. It doesn't hurt anymore. You're just, you've just decided that you're going to do it. And then there's this light bulb that kind of you know turns on and you're in it and it's like, what the hell was I so afraid of? That's the, that, that's the craziest thing about it because it's, it's sort of acceptance, leaning into the resistance, but it's not really being uncomfortable, being uncomfortable. It's be willing to get past the thought of being uncomfortable so many of the times. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing, isn't it? It's they, wild. They teach you this in school, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just the way the human mind works. And one thing I can tell you, I mean, the War of Art is what came out in 2002. So it's like 20 years old. I've gotten thousands of letters and emails and stuff from people. And I guarantee you that voice that you hear in your head is the same voice everybody else hears in mm -hmm. their head. Mm -hmm. You know, it's exactly the same. The idea of something is scarier than the reality. It's like the old Tom Petty thing. Most things I worry about never happen anyways, right? <laughs> it's yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah. Or another way of looking at it that I sometimes think about is it's like diving into a cold pool. Yeah. As you're standing on the side, you're like terrified, right? Oh yeah. my God, the shock is going to, you know, my heart's going to stop. Uh, the pain is going to, but once you dive in, you know, Pretty six much seconds over. later, you're swimming, you're fine. Mm -hmm. right? And it's all that uh, you, you say to yourself, why was I so afraid of this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Love yeah. And, and I kind of jumped to the end, but I think the lead up to everything that you were saying was clarity. I think, I think having that clarity in terms of what is really important to you will allow the, the next steps to happen in that chain that we just went through. So yeah. I, just, I didn't want to forget that. The other, the other thing, Jake, is like, let's say you do identify your dream, whatever it is. It's entrepreneurial, yeah. it's real estate or whatever. For me, it's a particular book that I'm terrified. If you don't do it, that energy doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. That energy turns negative. Mm -hmm. And inside you, it starts to eat at your guts. So it's not as though it's only an opportunity that you can choose to pass up and there's no price tag to that. There is a price tag. It's really once you, and even if you haven't identified this dream, there's a dream inside you. And that dream, if you're not up, if you're not working on it is going negative inside you, it's eating at your guts, mm -hmm. you know, whether you realize it or not. And I think that's why a lot of people get into things like, uh, alcoholism and whatever it is there uh it's it's a dream that's not being realized or not even being acted upon and it turns what did, negative what did it do for you personally in terms of you know emotionally and, and in so many levels when say you did complete bagger vance because the opposite would have been suppression and, and potential alcoholism but let's talk about the the upside of it what what were those emotions feelings just the, the, the life experience that, that you went through? You know, it, for me, it's, it's a great question. It, it wasn't a reaction of euphoria. Of course, yeah. writing a book is a lot different than, say, winning the Super Bowl, where you're this long game moment where 100,000 people are cheering and blah, blah, blah. When you write a book, you're all alone. You finish it. You, you send it in. It's, the book doesn't become, if it's a hit, it doesn't become a hit till a year later, right? Yeah. And by then you're, but... For me, in all honesty, when that book got, got out and was good, I felt like my whole life had been worth it. And all the years that I had gone through and all the shit I'd gone through was worth it. I felt like, you know, I felt like sort of my mom and dad would be proud of me. You know, yeah. I'm pr I felt like I'd finally done what I was put on this planet to do. And that's powerful. I started thinking forward. Well, what's the next one? <laughs> you know, now that I can do one, let me do two. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think it really is life, totally life changing, but at least in the writer's world, it's not like a moment of euphoria. It's a very quiet sort of private thing, but, yeah. um, but it's for real. 
but it's a serious feeling of accomplishment, I'm sure, which is, is pretty damn sweet, right? Yeah. And you really yeah. feel like everything I've run away from, I've, I've faced. Yeah. You know, I did it. I did what I, was, what I was supposed to do. And if I can do that, I, if I, I can do it again. You I stood up to the dragon with the sword and shield and you won. So yeah. you finally started living with your sole purpose. Once we figure out what our sole purpose is and we start living towards that, it's all, you feel as if you're playing with house money after that. It's like every day after that, it's like, wow, this is, I finally figured out what I need to do. And unfortunately it does take a lot of us many years to do that, <laughs> myself included, but it's okay. It's worth the struggle and it's worth the wait because once you've reached there man, it is a great feeling. And yeah, and I would just add, like I said before, Gino, it's not plain sailing from then on. No. The challenge for me, you know, like resistance never goes away. Yes. It's just as hard. Yes. You've done it once. Number two is, is even harder because now you're wondering, you know, am I going to live up to the uh, first one and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's kind of welcome to World War Three, you know, mm -hmm. but at least, you know, you're in. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're in the game though. Yeah. Um, a couple more before we wrap this up. Um, just to, you know, give folks, you know, the benefit of, of your journey, any mistake or something specific that delayed your success that you could say to mm -hmm. the folks out there, hey, this happened to me. I don't want you to the journey to take as long. This is something that I would do differently. Um, that's a great question, Jake. I, I think it took me so long, but as I look back on it, I think it, it was uh, it was all necessary. There wasn't any shortcut. I couldn't have done anything differently because I was starting from a place of such innocence and ignorance. I just didn't have a clue what was required of me. And little by little by little, you know, you just had to learn and learn and learn and keep doing it. So there, no, there really was no shortcut at any point that I, I could have taken. Like I had a career as a screenwriter that lasted about 10 years. And uh, I was a really lousy screenwriter but over those 10 years, and I had a lot of failures and all, over those 10 years, I learned what a writer does. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned what a story is. You know, I got my ass kicked over and over and over. But if I look back, I, I really couldn't have short circuited that. I sort of, it was part like of the process. a brain surgeon. You had to yeah. take those classes. You had to do that. So but the only thing I would say again and again is any of these things that are a real soul dream, where you're really doing what you put on this earth to do, it's hard. Yeah. It takes a long time. Only very few people are lucky and 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 get it right off the bat. But it's, Stephen, if you had the, if you had these two books, would they have helped you? If you had the War of Art, if somebody else wrote these books for you and you stumbled upon them and you read them and said, "Wow, would they have helped you?" Think short. No, your... That's a great question. Do you know, actually, I don't think they would have. Uh -huh. You know. I mean, they, they would have in the still wants you to buy the book though, folks, you got to get the book. All right. At least I'm telling you to, all right. <laughs> if you haven't read it, <laughs> it would have been the sense that, uh, I would say to myself, you know, it, let me put it this way. I would have had to read those books over and over and over. <laughs> I have. <laughs> and also I, I, you had, I had, I would have had to have lived certain experiences mm -hmm. and let it really sink into my DNA and into my mm -hmm. blood. Mm -hmm. It's, Sometimes I wonder when I write these books, I say, is this helping people or not? You know, because it's not an <laughs> instant fix. Yes. You know, um, but I think people who have sort of been on a journey and have been struggling and struggling and struggling, when they read something like The War of Art or Turning Pro, they go, oh, that's what I've been fighting mm -hmm. all this time. You know, mm -hmm. it's not yes. like it's completely new to them. And then mm -hmm. they go, oh, that gives me some clarity. Yes. But they've also done the work that far. They go, oh, okay, that I see now all these dead ends I've gone into, that was for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Any books that you want to recommend to the folks that added value to your life? Um, I have a few other books <laughs> that are in the, in the line of uh, the war of art. I'm going to ask you about that one next. <laughs> and there's a few of them. One is called nobody wants to read your shit. And it's really about writing. And there's another one called the artist journey. That's, that's also really good as a follow-up to those and actually, there's another one called Do the Work that is all, that kind of fits in between Turning Pro. I love that title. Of art. So I hate to be recommending my own stuff, but uh, I do think that it's kind of spot on on what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Do the Work, Gina. And where uh, best way for folks to get the books? Is it Amazon? Is it better on Amazon your website? Is the best place to, to go for it. 
Amazon is the place to go. Gino, I want you to wrap this up, but you got to tie in Bagger Vance a little bit because I think it'll be good. You talk to tie Juna, in Juna. So Stephen Pressfield, 10 years as a sucky screenwriter, working as a migrant worker, not pulling the pin on the train, <laughs> taking 27 years. It's never too late, people. That's the theme of this, I think, podcast. It's never too late. Understand the difference between an amateur and a professional. If you're looking to find your sole purpose, if you're looking to get into an endeavor, I think proximity is important. Surrounding yourself with people who are doing it. Find somebody who's going to hold you accountable. Read the war of art. Understand what the word resistance means. Just say it right now, everybody. Say resistance. How does that make you feel? You can feel the pain. You can feel the anxiety, but that's okay. I think, I think Find- the hair's standing up in the back of my neck. <laughs> Ask that question. What, what, you know, like, like Stephen had said a few minutes ago, what is that one thing? What is that one you know, goal or dream that you want to do? And when you get that in a millisecond, that's where you need to go. The harder the resistance, the harder you need to go towards your passion, Jake. I, I appreciate the clarity that you've provided me in my life and being able to mm-hmm. help me further my journey on becoming the best version of myself. So thank you for that, Stephen. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks, right. Stephen. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Gino. And let me say this, that what you guys are doing on this podcast, and I'm sure in a lot of your other stuff, is really a great thing. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're really putting it out there to help other people. That's what this is all about, right? That's right. And um, this is, you know, uh, nobody does it alone, right? We all have mentors. We all have people that we admire. And, and uh, what you guys are doing is that. So, you know, God bless you. Thanks for having me on. Um, and if you ever want to do this again, I'm, I'm very happy to do it. And, uh, you know, you're doing the, the Lord's work. Keep it up. I appreciate Thank you, it, Stephen. Thanks. Take care.